Thank you guys. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I'm really, really happy and excited. And this is a great opportunity to talk to friends. And in about 19 days, what's today? February, what was it, the 13th? Ugh. In about 19 days, it's going to be the year 2020. We made it. <laughs> I can remember the year 2000, you know, not to say my age like that, but it was the millennium, the Y2K scare was happening. Everybody was scared about computer glitches and everybody running to the bank. You know, and at that time, me and my wife we was newly married. Um, my wife, Jennifer, we was married two and a half years about this time and we was expecting our first child, um, little Elias. We was going to a, a party to celebrate Happy New Year's at grandma and grandma's house. And that's where everybody gets together, the whole family, mom, dad, all of us. Excuse me if I'm a little nervous, but it was a great day because, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a father and I was excited. And I was excited just to know that going to the party, I was in this, my father's old car. He had a, um, a Lincoln Continental, like an old car. He smoked a lot of cigars, so the car stunk a lot. So we used to call it the stinking Lincoln. So I'm in the stinking Lincoln on the way to grandma and grandma's house. And when I get there, my wife is telling me she's having some pains. And I was like, it can't be because we're like a month and a half early. And then the doctor said prior to that, hey, there might be chances of her catching preeclampsia. And it might induce her and make her go to the hospital into labor sooner than we expected. So that's what happened. So here we go, we're in the stinking Lincoln. I had to tell grandma and grandpa, I had to excuse myself, but I didn't really want to tell nobody. I ended up going downtown, flying down there. And since it was the year 2000, you know, I was hoping to get like a whole year supply of diapers. And, you know, I got the first child. I'm running here, walking in with my wife and she's screaming and yelling. And what I did is I took some champagne and some food with me and brought the whole party from the house <laughs> to the hospital. So I'm Latino, so we got grandma, grandpa, I mean, the whole family came. We flooded the whole hospital, and we stood there for a little bit, and almost 24 hours later, my wife gives birth to our firstborn, Elias. I was happy, smiling, especially when I heard that first cry. And I was so thankful when I heard that first cry, because I realized this is what I'm here for. You know, I always wanted to be a father, a husband, and especially, you know, from my background, I get the opportunity to do it all over again for somebody else and teach them right from wrong. I thank God for that opportunity. And I remember since he was premature, he couldn't come home right away. He had to stay there for um, 52 weeks. I was like, wow, welcome to fatherhood. Here you go. <laughs> the good thing is he was in his incubator every day just catching a suntan. And me and the wife was there every single day. And when he finally came home, we got the opportunity to now raise our boy. The only thing with him, when he's growing up, as he's developing, you start to um, see certain things. See, I have a lot of nephews, a lot of cousins, a lot of children running around in my house. So when you start seeing your boy now putting words together, he can't really put sentences together, you start to have some concern. He would flap a little bit, maybe. He would just say, I love you, mom, dad, thank you, hi, bye, things like that. But we was concerned. He's six years old now. And there's no way a kid should be doing, you know, speaking like that. So we got him tested. And I remember clearly when we went and got him tested, not far from here, actually. Actually up the block. <laughs> I, was, I passed it on the way over here. I remember it was a beautiful day. And I remember a big old window, and it was a clear day beautiful bright day and it was me my wife and my mother-in-law and when we went over there the doctor the first thing he said to my son was how does it look outside mind you it's a beautiful day it's bright is it raining is it snowing my son quickly said snowing and I was like wow it's not snowing so he asked him again and he said raining and then he went back to snowing and I was like wow Something is wrong. <laughs> the second test I remember was like a, a photo of a microwave. And most of us know what a microwave does, what a microwave looks like. He looked at it, didn't even know how to start one. I just automatically thought he knew how to do it. They have pictures even of 
of a, of a man standing in front of some stairs with an arrow. And when he stood there, he would ask my son, what does the man look like he's about to do? He couldn't even figure out that the man was walking up the stairs. Before this, before the autism, and since this is my first child, all I knew about autism was the movie Rain Man with Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. Good movie, by the way. <laughs> Smart guy. Other than that, I had to dig into the books. I was not scared about it because I didn't know what I was about to, <laughs> about to start. So me and my wife left. Come on, let's go. Let's go get it. We could do it. This is what we're supposed to do. This is, you know, this is what the cards have been dealt. And I'm fine with that. But as you research, you start looking and you start now taking him to therapy. And now his behavior is a little different. And he's not filtering the same information. It gets really tough and challenging, especially on marriages. Financially, even. Physically, emotionally. You go with through, you go through all of it. One thing I knew from all of it, though, is you don't give up. You just don't quit. As bad as you want to, because I wanted to quit a bunch of times, I just cut it. I made a commitment to him that day, on the first, of January 1st, 2000, a promise. A promise to me, myself, to God, that I'm going to take care of this kid. So let's go. So we advocate him right about now. Fast forward. My son is now going through therapy, going to school, he's mainstreamed, he's, um, he's doing well. My wife gave up everything, quit her job after 10 years and said, hey, take over, you have to work your butt off because I'm going to stay home. <laughs> and I was okay with it, I was a little scared, cause I was like, oh man, I'm never going to see how, the house again. <laughs> and I'm a barber, so I definitely was cutting hair at rapid space. I mean, at rapid, at rapid speed, I would time everything, like, at least for an hour, at least for an hour. That's 18 minutes at least. Get the payment and go. Like, I was spinning that chair because <laughs> I needed to pay for therapy. It was 125 bucks <laughs> an hour, and I needed a minimum of three hours a week. And that's just that, you know, and mind you, the other things I needed. But I was still happy, you know, and, and still excited that I had a partner next to me that was gun hold with me. He's doing well in school. And I remember I'm the hands-on kind of father, so I pack up his lunch every day. Um, I pick him up, drop him off, and when I started picking him up, I started realizing he's a little tired, you know, like extra tired every day. And he's not eating none of his lunch. So when he's not eating none of his lunch, I asked his, his mom, and she noticed the same thing. It's the same type of behaviors. She starts to... Um, Wonder, like, you know, he has autism, so certain things doesn't click as it would click for us. So he's usually taking a little longer in the bathroom, like most of us, you know. You know, every time he goes to do number two. My wife says, hey, go inside the bathroom and just knock on the door and ask him, to, let me see inside the, the bathroom, see if everything's okay. I open up the door, and I'm like, hey, let, me, let me take a look. When I take a look, I'm telling you, this toilet bowl, a bright white toilet bowl, was red, like tomato soup. And I'm like, huh, I'm about to freak out at this point. But I can't, you know? I got my son looking at me, so I quickly tell my wife, and I was like, listen, we have a problem. And kids on the spectrum, they don't think like us. You know, they filter information for, for God knows how long that was happening and how long it was going for until we started realizing it was getting worse and worse and worse. When we take them to the hospital, that's when they diagnosed him this time with ulcerative colitis, UC. Woo, challenge number two. So not only <laughs> at 11 years of age, he, um, at six he learned how to talk. At 11, he's dealing with the autism and now has ulcerative colitis. And as a parent, all you want is the best for your kid. You want to make sure that you are Just making sure you're doing the right things. This is my first time talking publicly about it. It's real raw and still real fresh for me. But I think that's the best way to, to speak it, you know? So excuse me. At the age of 11, I had to talk to my son and let him know, hey, listen. We have another challenge, but we can do it. We can do it together, me, your mom, us three. 
well, we got this. So what we decided to do, we had to convince my son at the age of 13, we need to have surgery now. This is his first surgery. So we removed his colon at this time. We removed the colon, we're dealing with the recovery of that and getting remission now, thank God. My father calls me and then he tells me, hey, I got some news to tell you. So I was like, all right, cool. And me and my father is real close. He says, I just went to the doctor and he just diagnosed, diagnosed me with prostate cancer, stage four. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But we're all strong. We can all do things. We, we, we don't realize how strong we are until we start getting hit and we start going through these seasons. Thank God for my wife and thank God for my foundation, my faith. Because through the challenges, me and my wife got closer. Instead of going this way, we got tighter. So did me and my son. My father's relationship and I got closer. All the way to eight months where he lost the battle and God asked him to come upstairs. We focused on our son, me and my wife. <laughs> and now, when we, while he's in remission, at the age of 16, it comes back again. <laughs> Sometimes I even talk about it, I, I can't even believe it. Like, there's no way. <laughs> I was sometimes in Arnold Palmer, I mean, at Advent Health, half the day, and the other half the day with my father, with my father downtown, hospital after hospital, months and months and years and years. When the disease came back, it came back as Crohn's disease, and then it led to rectal cancer, stage three for my son. That was a great day in 1999, I mean, 2000. I thank God for that day and that opportunity to be a father because I knew that was my purpose to be here and make sure that I could get him through all these challenges. And for whatever reason, I wasn't even scared on this last one. I was like, I was kind of numb. I had developed like kind of a callous kind of skin, like nothing could really bother me really. I felt like I dealt with enough. My emotions was just scarred. But I had a good woman, I still got a good wife and a good woman. She kept me pushing, kept each other pushing. I told my son, we have to go to surgery again. For the first time, he said that he felt like a loser. He didn't feel like a winner. So I was like, oh, then you're a winner. Trust me, you're a winner. And throughout all this chaos, I started thinking like, oh, my God, like, how do I explain to my son you're still a winner? So I told him, hey, listen, one day me and your mom, when you was conceived, on a good night, <laughs> daddy's fishes could just go whew, about 250 to so 350 million fishes just going to the finish line. And they're all in a race. It's just like being in a marathon. And they're all in a race. And they all got one goal just to get to the finish line. And I told them, you won. You won. You made it, to the, you made it there. You made it with purpose. So you was born a winner. Keep winning. Let's win. All these challenges, I would question why, but then it starts to unfold and you see that sometimes we have to be selfish and give up even our own dreams, our own, our own everything, just for someone else's success. I'm grateful for today. I'm grateful for the 86,400 seconds every single day. I'm grateful now that I can see my sons in remission. 
and spent 22 months. I could be grateful that me and my wife got like this. Me and God got like this. Me and my family got like this. Me and my son got like this. I'm grateful that he got extra time on the clock. So this year, 2020, I'm partying. <laughs> Thank you.